Welcome to MIT Supply Chain Frontiers from the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Each episode features center researchers and staff who welcome experts from the field for in-depth conversations about business, education, and beyond. On today's episode, Center Director Professor Yossi Sheffi speaks with two seasoned supply chain professionals about some of the business and leadership innovations that the disruptions in 2020 brought about for them and their organizations. And he asks some compelling questions as we look toward the future. Take it away, Yossi. Hello, everybody. I'm Yossi Sheffi. First of all, thank you, Linda Day, for joining me today. Let me quickly introduce the two of them to our audience. I'll start with uh, Lynn, Chief Procurement and Supply Chain Officer at uh, Flex. Uh, Flex is the company that used to be called Flextronics. Many of you remember Flextronics. Started 51 years ago at Silicon Valley, then moved the headquarters to Singapore and later changed its name to Flex. It's a contract manufacturing which does and can do almost anything. Many of the things that brands are selling are actually made by Flex. The company has $24 billion in revenue and 160,000 employees and very complex, actually multiple supply chain. It's hard to talk about Flex and think about this supply chain. They have so many. Now, Lynn Torrent is responsible for this multitude of supply chain. She is a graduate of the University of Minnesota with an MBA from the Carey School of Business in Arizona State. Hi, Lynn. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Yossi. Uh, let me introduce Dave Wheeler from New Balance. New Balance was founded in 1906, so it's an old company in Boston, as an art support company by William Riley, who actually, I don't know if it's true or not, but the urban legend is that he followed the way chicken balanced their gate and decided this is the perfect way to balance one's, and they say that he had the chicken leg on his, on his desk for, for many years. By now, of course, the company sell athletic wear in 120 countries with five and a half billion dollars in revenue and 8,000 associates. It is a private corporation. David Wheeler is the chief operating officer of New Balance. He studied in Merrimack College. He's an engineer and has an MBA from Miami University. I should say that both Dave and Lynn were generous with their time in the middle of the pandemic, which tax every supply chain executive. They both allowed me to interview them about what was going on during the pandemic around the, around the world, providing material for my book that came out in October this year, The New Abnormal, Reshaping Business and Supply Chain Strategy Beyond COVID-19. Both have operation in China. It's interesting because Flex, of course, is a B2B operation, while uh, New Balance is a B2C operation, serving, uh, serving consumer directly. So there are come from one private company, one public company, coming from two sides of the, of the supply chain. So what I'd like to do now is start with a few questions. We just went through an amazing and tough period. What's the biggest insight or aha moment that came out of this for you, for you and for your organization? Well, I think one of the most interesting dynamics is that 10 months ago, nobody was really talking about supply chains. People just expected them to work and, and deliver the products. Now supply chain is a topic on everyone's mind and it is very pervasive in the, in the industry today, the importance of supply chain and supply chain resiliency. I also believe that digitalization tools provided great information to allow our organization to address the supply chain challenges throughout the pandemic. But it also highlighted to me the importance of supply chain professionals making smart decisions with imperfect information throughout this challenge. And I also believe that it validated the investments that Flex has made over the past years in our digitalization tools to be able to stay at, as quick as we could in our decision making as we addressed all of the challenges that we were faced on a daily basis throughout the pandemic. Thank you, Lynn. Dave, what was it for you, the, uh, the insight and aha moment that came out of the, of the pandemic? Good morning, Yossi, and uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me on here. Good to share some stories. It's certainly been a challenging 2020 for sure, um, you know, a combination of loss and chaos and um, certainly um, some opportunity as well. And, you know, I think maybe two parts I'd share. One is um, 
I guess I'm not too surprised that having a burning platform brings people together. You know, if I think back to the earthquakes in Haiti, you know, we rallied around our suppliers to make sure that they were supported. And we also figured out ways to get back up on our feet in, in fairly short order. So seeing a team come together for a common cause um, certainly was the story of this year for us. Um, I also think we all surprised ourselves around the ability to come together in a virtual way um, using tools that have been available, um, but certainly have come together for you know, the masses, which enabled us to work together really in a more seamless way. And in many cases, more effectively to get to conclusions, make decisions and take action, you know, in a way that hadn't happened in the past. So, you know, that for me, the ability to work virtually essentially was the big aha moment for me in 2020. Thank you, Dave. And we may come to this point because we really, it will be interesting to know later how much of this will stay after the pandemic, including working virtually and other things. But uh, Lynn, you mentioned before that supply chain became, people used to ask my wife, what's your husband doing? He's uh, doing research in supply chain. And they say, what is it? Nobody asked, what is it now? They say, oh, wow, that's important. But within the company, what happened to you and your function as a result of this? Well, supply chain within the Flex organization has always been a critical aspect of our business. So it was always highlighted as a strategic importance within the Flex organization. But I do think in many companies, supply chain became more prominent in the discussions and direction and decisions that companies were making. Yeah, Dave, you used to be the head of supply chain. Now you're running the whole operations. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I think... Um, New Balance is a little bit different, right? So we're a consumer facing brand. So when we think about the most prominent functions in the company, it's about marketing and merchandising and those types of functions. Supply chain is there to support those efforts. And in the early parts of the pandemic and actually throughout 2020, um, you know, supply chain has been thrust into the forefront a lot, a lot further, um, very visible often uh, having discussions with ownership and the CEO and the CFO and, you know, really trying to make sure that, um, you know, our efforts are headed down the right path to support the demand, which has really fluctuated both down and up in a significant way. So the V for us has been real, you know, we'll still end the year on the negative side versus 2019, but certainly in the latter half of this year, you know, volume is up significantly. So we're actually chasing the supply at the moment. Oh, wow. Let me follow up on this with you, Dave. To do this, of course, the supply chain has to be not siloed, but work together with every other function in the, uh, in the organization. Can you talk more about the uh, cooperation with other functions? Yeah, sure thing. Um, you know, we found in 2020 that the working in an agile way really helped us accelerate change. And, you know, in the past we had run projects in a more traditional, you know, longer term, get a Gantt chart, really have key milestones. Uh, we created in the March, April timeframe, a series of what we call pods, agile pods that were very cross-functional, had a 90 day time limit, and had key deliverables along the way. And so every other day that team was together in a cross-functional way. And that synergy was really game-changing for us because we could pivot a lot quicker given all the inputs from the various functions. So that was significant for us this year, for sure. Lynn? Well, when the pandemic first started in January, we were getting information out of our, our Chinese operations. And one of the things I did is we created a daily call with my leadership team and other areas of cross-functional business leadership from our resiliency team, our legal team, our tax team. And we had a daily call at 5.30 in the morning, my time, for months. And I think that was incredibly important in how we addressed the challenges we were facing we would have a very structured agenda for the daily call. We would hear from our regional leaders, what they were hearing from customers, what they were hearing from suppliers, 
what they were hearing from the media or local governments. We look at the information we had from our suppliers and our customers forecast to understand where we may have supply chain risk. And then we employed tiger teams to address the significant challenges we had. And that daily rigor of the calls and our ability to move very quickly and readjust our, our teams to focus on the most critical aspects that we were working on provided a great deal of resiliency in our, our supply chain. We had we cover a great you know, number of industries at Flex. So we had instances where some of our customers' forecasts were going through the roof and we were chasing our, our medical supply, medical business, for instance. Uh, you know, drop in lead time demands, shortages uh, that we were chasing. And we had other uh, parts of our business where the forecasts were declining rapidly. So having that daily rigor, being able to deploy the vast resources that we have within the supply chain organization to both expedite orders and cancel orders and understand what other challenges we might be facing, such as sourcing PPE equipment or freight and logistics challenges and making the decisions based on the discussions we were having on a daily basis was very critical. Just uh, following on, what, on the comment that Dave made, do you see the business that was down, do you see it starting to go back up? Yes, in, in many cases, the rebound has been dramatic in, in the increase. And like Dave, we are uh, chasing supply, supply right now because the, the, demand is, the demand is high and now we're, we're certainly seeing some shortages that we're working on to make sure we clear to recognize revenue and, and support our customers. But, and I do think throughout the entire pandemic with the forecast going up or down, we really work to, with our customers closely to validate their forecast. And I wanted to ensure when we were working with our suppliers, we were giving true demand signals and prioritizing appropriately. So they would be able to work within their organizations, which were also challenged because of the pandemic. And we worked very closely and collaboratively and compassionately with our partners to try and ensure we could meet the demand. Dave, could you just comment on working with, with your suppliers? Sure, yeah, it certainly was challenging in that April and May timeframe uh, as we went in and, and put a hold on production. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we had really strong relationships with our tier ones and also respecting the tier twos and tier threes as they tried to you know, stay financially solvent um, and so it was a real delicate balance, actually. And um, we put a lot of emphasis, a lot of resources around understanding the data at a very detailed level uh, so that we could repurpose the certain materials that were already purchased by the tier one into the tier twos um, rather than leave them, you know, holding the financial liability. Um, and so fortunately, we were able to, you know, work down a material liability of over $10 million, essentially down to zero by just trying, just really using the data. Again, respecting the suppliers because we need them for the long run. And I think those relationships are so critical. You know, I would also maybe tag on there that, you know, living in this virtual world, it does certainly become challenging to maintain those relationships at the level that we have had in the past you know, in person really does make a big difference. So we can get 90% there, but, you know, that extra 10% makes, makes really does make for a, a much stronger supplier relationship. And we look forward to getting back to the, at least some level of travel in the near future, for sure. Yes, I, uh, interesting. I, in the book, I quote uh, Lynn actually, that talks about the fact how important it is to sit at the end of the day face to face have tough negotiations and then have dinner together. It's just the way trust, trust is being built. But uh, Lynn, following on other discussion that uh, we had before, there's a lot of focus on resilience from your customer. We want you to be resilient. What are the challenges here? That's a great question. And it's actually a topic that I'm exploring in a series of blogs on the Flex website. Everybody's talking about a resilient supply chain. And we believe that there are a number of ways in which you can work with your customers and suppliers to drive more resiliency. Visibility is, is incredibly important. Digitalization and collaboration. 
So when we're looking at driving a resilient supply chain, there's numerous ways you can do it. It's some, in some cases, it's like an insurance policy. Is that having additional inventory? And if so, who funds that additional inventory? Is it uh, looking at alternative suppliers to de-risk the supply chain? And it's also from an internal standpoint, looking throughout your entire organization to find out where you may have resiliency risks and continuously improving uh, internally to drive improvements in that area. Thank you. And um, Dave, you face different challenges because you are not faced by huge customers. Each one is a large percent of your business who can exert pressure. I mean, you are facing consumers. I mean, you're facing some retail chain, obviously, that buy more than, uh, than others. But uh, so you have, uh, how do you deal with the move to e-commerce and omnichannel? Sure. I mean, even prior to the pandemic, we had seen quite a shift from wholesale into our wholesale re retailers over to, you know, direct to consumer e-com type sales. And um, it's certainly accelerated in a big way in 2020. I think as many companies have found as folks stay at home and can't get out to the retailers. So um, we have seen an acceleration in that type of sales, uh, you know, that's launched us three years beyond where we expected um, to be. And as you can imagine, that puts a lot of stress on the supply chain, you know, from, you know, the way that we distribute the product and then finally deliver it into the consumer's hands versus a customer of wholesale, a completely different set of processes. So we have quite an effort underway within our warehouse network and that transportation capability uh, to make sure that we can, you know, catch up and also, you know, sustain what happens in 2021, which we, which we expect will be continued growth in e-com. You know, I think on top of that, we are certainly getting into the omni-channel capability, utilizing our stores to ship smaller volumes of certain SKUs that consumers want in a relatively short period of time. They're used to that Amazon potentially same day within two hour type delivery. And we are working down that path with a couple of pilot projects utilizing our brick and mortar, which is super exciting for us. Thank you. Um, both of you have operations in China. Both of you are also selling in China. So Lee, let's, let's go to you. Are you gonna move out of China? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Flex has- This was a setup, a setup, I know, I know. Yeah. Flex has a large footprint in China and we are committed to our employees and other stakeholders there. And we also have a diverse and global footprint and, and depend on uh, supply chain from China to support our customers. China is unparalleled in their electronics manufacturing and supply chain capabilities. And the hubs, you know, the technology hubs that have been built have been decades in the making. And so we will continue to, to work with our valuable suppliers from China to support our, our customers. I think at the same time, we need to look at resiliency and de-risking the supply chain. So I anticipate change, but not in, in the short term. Uh, we'll continue to, to value our suppliers and, and our uh, production in China. Dave? I think similar, similar to Lynn's uh, perspective, you know, certainly New Balance has a strong consumer base in China. So producing in China for consumer consumption in China makes a lot of sense to us in the apparel and footwear business in general. You know, it's not as high of a value add as electronics, for example. And so across the industry, we've seen migration generally away from China, but still some volume remains there, especially for, let's say, high performance technical running. And certain capabilities that China has built up over the decades are outstanding that businesses like New Balance want to stay there in particular. Um, but China certainly has and brings a lot of great production capability to the table that we're certainly proud of for a lot of different reasons. And we source globally. You know, we, we're proud that we're the only major athletic brand that produces right here in the United States with five factories in New England. So we're very diversified on our supply chain base. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a lot of related questions before we go to the, uh, to the um, technology, lots of technology questions uh, about the, you know, the Trump administration and, 
and others are talking about regionalization and uh, moving to insourcing instead of outsourcing. You see, I did not see much of this, but do you, do you see in, in your company, do you have part of your strategy to bring more stuff in, in home, Lynn? Well, Flex has the benefit of a, a large global presence, large global footprint. You wrote in your book about China plus one. Yes. You know, Flex, Flex can offer China plus 50 um, as an option for, for manufacturing. So I do believe that, you know, talking about resiliency and regionalization, it means different things to different companies and to different industries. We believe that there's an opportunity to look at partnering with customers who potentially have done their own manufacturing and want to look at maybe de-risking by using a partner like Flex to take on a portion of their production to provide that uh, resiliency and, and risk mitigation strategies. But in, in general, I do believe that uh, there is a lot of talk of regionalization and resiliency and there, it needs to be defined exactly what that means for a customer, for their strategies, and then looking at, is that something they want to do themselves? Is that something they want to partner with? We also offer services in engineering because the manufacturing is one aspect, the entire supply chain is another aspect. So if we have customers who have a, a single source device as part of their technology innovation, can we provide alternatives that come from a different supplier manufactured in a different region to help de-risk the supply chain? So I think there's a lot of ways in which we can drive resiliency and, and support regionalization uh, as, as our customers want to define that. Dave? Sure, well, yeah, we have a real interesting combination, I think. Um, you know, I, I guess I would tie it to a key initiative we have underway and have had over the last couple of years, but especially in, in 2020, um, it's been focused on design for lead time, you know? And so as we think about an agile responsive supply chain, a lot of that is around lead time, shortened lead time so that we can sense demand and rapidly respond with supply. And, and that tends to um, focus our energy around localized, regionalized supply base. Um, and our ability to open up our own capabilities there in every single country that we, that we sell into is unrealistic, you know? And so using um, an outsourced specialized capability on a regionalized basis makes a lot of sense to us. And that will certainly continue to be the trend as we design for lead time um, so that we can respond shorten up our, you know, um, inventory turns and, and really get a little bit, um, you know, more precise around what inventory we have on hand based on our sell through. So that would be our trend at the moment. Thank you. Every virtual conference that I'm on, every other question that I get is digitization of the supply chain. Okay, the question is, what do we mean by this? <laughs> Which technology goes where? What are the technology? I, for example, Flex, I know, developed this unbelievable NASA-like worm that looks at the, at the whole supply chain. That's something that takes a lot of money and time to develop. Lynn, if you can just say a word about your system that was developed actually even before, well before the pandemic, but then about the technology that you think are critical for making the supply chain more agile, responsive, shorten the lead time, increase you know, inventory turn, and all the good things that we expect. Yeah, Flex benefited greatly during the pandemic in the investments we've made in our digital technology. And the best example is the Flex Pulse Center, which we started in 2015 and have con been continuously innovating since. So Flex is a cloud-based intelligent platform that provides real-time visibility into our entire global supply chain. And we use it to manage all aspects of our business. We're able to go in you know, with a click of a button and look at you know, a global picture, drill down to a regional picture, a site level, a customer level to a part number level and understand you know, what potential gating aspects we may have. 
So the insights we are able to glean from our, our Flex system are incredibly powerful. Prior to joining Flex, I was a supplier to Flex that I remember my first visit to the Flex Pulse Center. And I told my predecessor that I had data envy because it was so powerful. Coming now and joining Flex, I realized how critical and important those investments are in managing such a complex supply chain. Yossi, you mentioned it at the beginning. We have, you know, we support over a thousand customers uh, with 16,000 suppliers, and that translates into a million SKUs. So that working across multiple industries makes it incredibly complex. So the visibility that we have from our Pulse Center is incredible. It was a significant investment in the continuous innovation. And, and we've innovated even with lessons learned uh, from COVID. And one of those was, uh, and Dave, you mentioned it, the, the tier two, tier three supplier and, and the lack of visibility, um, both from their supply chain, but as well as their financial health. And that those are areas where we believe in further, furthering the capabilities of our system will require you know, third party partners to, to support us with that information. Because even before COVID, you know, we had environmental issues impacting our supply chain. Then you had the trade tensions, then the global pandemic. That, that need for resiliency and visibility is more critical than ever. And in some cases, it will require really an industry-wide type of connection to be able to gather the information in, and provide that visibility. We have nine of those around the world, uh, uh, pulse centers, and, and they're, you know, wall length uh, across a room, digitalization tools that provide live streaming and really actionable insight towards where we may have challenges. So it's, it is a uh, very state of the art from what we've developed. Absolutely. Uh, Dave, can you talk to us about where do you see the most important investment in, uh, uh, in supply chain digitization? What problems are we trying to solve? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, we've made the decision to, as many companies have, um, either in the past or at least thinking about it, um, to really invest in a new ERP and a new supply chain planning suite, which will you know, bring in demand sensing, actual sell-through data, point of sale information, use AI to give us a better forecast. That's the expectation because it all starts with the forecast. And um, so we're excited about that and we're about ready to get started on it. Um, so as far as software and the platform to help us tie end-to-end -end supply chain together, that's a big deal for us. I would say on the product side, you know, there are a couple of areas that really came to the forefront in 2020. One was, you know, in the past, we have done some 3D product modeling so our suppliers have capabilities that we have helped them get you know, ramped up with um, to be able to create a 3D you know, computerized model of a shoe that's in the design phase. And, and in the past, you know, we've created physical prototypes which get produced and then sent, transportation, handling, all that. All that adds about four to six weeks onto the overall production cycle. And if they get it wrong, then we start that over again. <laughs> With the 3D model, which we've really invested quite a bit of money in, and just in the recent past, you know, in 2020, we were able to really turn these prototypes quickly in the virtual world. And so that's been a big, big improvement for us in the digital transformation. The next step is to be able to take that 3D model and have it blow out into a bill of material and then digitally right to the shop floor. And so there is a lot of work across a number of different suppliers to help us get to that point as well. And I know a lot of companies in our industry are working toward that. And that I think will be true product, you know, digital transformation. I'm excited about that. Good. Let me change tax. Let's go back to Lean. During the pandemic, has it changed the way that as executive, you do your job, how you lead your organization. You have a pretty large organization reporting to you. And uh, did it change your leadership style? I think it probably enhanced uh, some of the strategies that I've always employed. One of my leadership tenants has always been collaboration. 
I always believe that it's important to have teams working together to drive the best results because it's a very complex industry that we're in. And I think that came to uh, another level during uh, our, our pandemic because certainly, you know, I was relatively new to, to Flex when the pandemic broke out. I, I joined of October of 2019. So when we started those daily calls uh, with my leadership team who are phenomenal, experts in their area, we would have a discussion and I said, I wanted to hear everybody's voice and everybody's concern when we were having these discussions because we needed to make quick decisions to mitigate our supply chain and we would meet again in the morning in case we had to adjust them. So I would say, I think collaboration was uh, something that in increased across the organization as people understood all aspects of our business needed to be in constant communication um, to understand the customers, the suppliers, our manufacturing capabilities. We had our, our manufacturing sites close down and open up as our suppliers were closing down and opening up. So we shifted product around the world to, to make sure we could recognize revenue and support our customers. So collaboration was enhanced. And I think communication, one of the things I learned personally is the importance of ongoing regular communication. In some cases, I thought it might be repetitive, but recognizing the organization wanted to hear from the leadership team, even if in cases it wasn't perfect information or we knew exactly what was going on, but really learned that that regular communication to the employees was very important in such an uncertain time that they would hear from the leadership team on the strategies we were employing for the business. Dave, what can you say about your leadership style and did anything jump to you during the pandemic? Yeah, I think I would just, you know, 100%, you know, emphasize Lynn's points right on target as far as, you know, communication, collaboration. I would just maybe add a, an additional point that I've recognized, certainly working in the virtual world with the staff folks, you know, that are working from home and in other locations. You know, my leadership style when in the office has always been, let's have a meeting. And prior to that meeting, there's a lot of work that actually gets done. After the meeting, when you're breaking up and having hallway conversation, a lot of work actually gets done there. And in Zoom calls or team calls, when you hit that leave button, it, that ends, you know? And so that's the part that I recognize that we were missing out on, even though during the meeting, super collaborative, people can hop on in almost on a moment's notice, you know, with no travel, which is fantastic, but intentionally carving out a little bit of extra time to connect into individuals for five or 10 minutes has made a big difference because after all, we're all part of the human race. We like to socialize. We want to talk about what's on our mind. And as we do that, we not only create new ideas and innovate, um, but we feel connected. And so, you know, on top of what Lynn said, I, I just add that additional part. Certainly people did amazing things during the pandemic. And I wrote a book, usually it takes me four years. I wrote it in four months, but uh, that's nothing compared to developing the vaccine that, uh, you know, thought people can do it, it takes 10 years, people do it in eight, uh, eight nine months. I mean, amazing, with, with new technology. So I didn't mention the fact that Flex started making ventilators and Nubana started making masks. Amazing how companies just did the right thing and without much prodding and all this, just, I'm just mentioned that uh, it, it was interesting to me that the masks that Nubana developed were developed by the supply chain people, not by the designers. So, and it looked great. Uh, but it's one thing to do all this, as you say, when the whole team feels that there's a burning platform, it's important, and people work on a lot of adrenaline. The question is, so we learn how to do things fast. The question is how to keep some of this going forward. Well, it's interesting. I had a discussion about this yesterday. Um, flexibility is in our name and in our DNA. <laughs> I think at Flex. Um, we have, you know, as a contract manufacturer and logistics provider, we support our customers and, and we have to be very agile. We are introducing new products, you know, around the world in any one of our factories, multiple new product introductions at the same time that we're bringing products to end of life and managing that complexity of the supply chain. So it was 
I would say, you know, we always work fast and try and be flexible and agile to support our customers because that's our business. When we moved into the ventilator production, we added passion um, because we understood that you know, we were making products that were desperately needed around the world to, to save lives. And that was something I felt was um, really critical for the organization. I mentioned those 5.30 a.m. calls because they were really early for me when the pandemic started. When we started doing, getting ready to ramp our ventilator production, I was up before my alarm. I couldn't wait to get on the phone to understand what we could do to get the products we needed, to get the engineering resources, the supply chain resources to drive that product. So certainly that, uh, you know, for, for, for our business, we need to be flexible and agile, but we certainly saw a difference in the level of passion during that time. Dave, how, how do you keep the spirit that made, I don't know, I described in the book, making masks within basically over a long weekend, putting together MIT and Massachusetts General Hospitals and all your manufacturing and material on hand and just doing it in, in days, really. This is, Amazing. You mentioned that it's um, a product of the supply chain, and that is a true design for manufacturing because we leveraged our available capabilities and materials. Um, and uh, there was a ton of passion around it, no question about it. We did it within, like you said, a long weekend and, and really tapping into the talent that we needed to bring to the table because we weren't mask experts. We didn't work in the FDA you know, world prior to this, we're footwear and apparel makers. And, um, and so there was a lot of learning and, you know, fortunately folks came to the table and, and rallied together. I think, you know, how do we keep that momentum up? Um, we learned a lot along the way uh, in the mask making business that has actually helped us. There are some lessons learned and new processes. To your point, I mean, we made mistakes in the mask, you know, creation. You know, we, as you recall back in March, we didn't even really know what type of mask to make. Was it an N95 mask, a surgical mask, a basic face mask? What was the demand? And you know, all these you know changing consumer inputs. Um, and you know, we made three versions within about six weeks, and we produced over a million masks and have donated those in the hundreds of thousands of masks at this point. But certainly, lessons learned as far as implementing certain quality processes along the way as we shorten up that time frame so that we don't you know incur any additional errors on our apparel and footwear business so kind of a combination of things of new processes to ensure quality as we accelerate the process that's needed right now in this new you know consumer environment i really want to thank both dave and lee for taking time out of what is a very busy and hectic schedule still today to share with us some of the lesson learned from this uh, uh, period. Thanks uh, everybody, stay well. All right, everyone, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this edition of MIT Supply Chain Frontiers. My name is Arthur Grau, Communications Officer for the Center. I invite you to visit anytime at ctl.mit.edu or search for MIT Supply Chain Frontiers on your favorite listening platform. Until next time.